In this video, we're going to continue our discussion about the duties of trustees. So the next duty is that of avoiding dealing with the trust property on their own account. So trustees have property and are required to do certain things with it. For example, maintain it, look after it and make sure it is as profitable as it can be. But you cannot deal with it to any extent that might cause you to profit yourself. And we have this quote from Lord Eldon from Ex Parte Lacey, which says that a trustee who is entrusted to sell and manage for others undertakes in the same moment in which he becomes a trustee not to manage for the benefit and advantage of himself. So in a situation in which a trustee purports to deal on her account with the trust property, and especially if she takes a property from such a transaction, not only will the trustee re be required to hold that profit on constructive trust for the beneficiary of the trust, but also the transaction itself may be set aside. Now, previously, we've considered the obligations of fiduciaries when making unauthorised profits uh, from their office in general terms. The specific relation or the specific problem in relation to their self-dealing to the self-dealing principle is that the trustees are purporting to deal with the beneficiaries of their fiduciary power as a third party, for example, when seeking to buy property from that trust. In that instance, the trustee would be acting simultaneously on behalf of the trust as well as acting on her own behalf. Such a transaction is, is considered to bear the risk that the trustee will acquire property from the trust at an advantageous price and thus exploiting the beneficiaries. Although by the same token, it might be argued on the facts of some cases that the price which the trustee obtains would have been the same price which the beneficiaries would have obtained on the open market and therefore that there is nothing wrong with the transaction. There is authority that a trustee may, with full disclosure and for a fair price, buy the beneficial interest of the property from the beneficiaries. So it is possible you could buy the beneficial interest off a beneficiary. So there are cases that have allowed this, but there has to be full written consent and there must be no undue influence, duress, etc. So there is authority that suggests there is not a hundred percent preclusion from obtaining trust property as a trustee. And so we have this quotation from McGarry which says that the self-dealing rule is, to put it very shortly, that if a trustee sells the trust property to himself, the sale is voidable by any beneficiary ex debito justiciae, however fair the transaction. The fair dealing rule is, again putting it very shortly, that if a trustee purchases the beneficial interest of any of his beneficiaries, the transaction is not voidable ex debito justiciae, but can be set aside by the beneficiary unless the trustee can show that he has taken no advantage of his position and has made full disclosure to the beneficiary and that the transaction is fair and honest. So. There is some authority then that the trustee can buy trust property. In other words, they can buy the beneficial interest from a beneficiary. So to put it another way, where a trustee deals with a beneficiary's interest in the trust or acquires the beneficiary's interest, there will be an obligation on the trustee to demonstrate fair dealing. So this is known as the fair dealing principle. Therefore, there is a burden of proof on the trustee to demonstrate both that no advantage was taken of the beneficiary and that the beneficiary was made fully aware of the nature and the circumstances of the transaction. Now, where there is no disclosure to the beneficiary, the transaction will be set aside. And that's from a case called Hidden Langley from 1988. Also have a look at this case of Holder and Holder from 1968. And this is a case where someone was an executor of a will and he bought some of the property and the court did actually allow him to get away with that so except exceptionally some flexibility was permitted in this case when the court of appeal decided that it was possible for a court a court to inquire into the trustee's knowledge and intentions and to decide on that basis that it was permissible for transactions in good faith to be affirmed by the court rather than just being voidable. 
So in this case, a testator's son had formally renounced his status as executor and had taken almost no part in the administration of the estate itself. The son acquired the freehold to a farm of which he had formerly been tenant from his father's estate at auction. And the price uh, the price reached was greatly in excess of the reserve price. So consequently, the Court of Appeal held that the transaction should not be voidable on the grounds that the son had taken no substantive action as trustee, nor had he benefited from any transaction at an undervalue as a result. So that wraps up this particular uh, point and this, this duty of trustees to avoid dealing with the trust property on their own account. Another duty of trustees is to act without re remuneration except as allowed by the trust instrument or by law. So as a general rule, trustees cannot be paid for acting as trustees except as provided by the trust instrument itself. Now this principle is laid out um, in the case of Bray and Ford and the trustees are not allowed to make a profit from the trust whether by dealing with the trust property on their own account or by paying money to themselves from the trust money. So the trustee is entitled to be remunerated for any services to the trust um, even if that service could have been performed by a lay trustee so that is someone who is not professionally qualified to carry out that task. A trustee acting in a professional capacity is entitled to receive such remunerations as is reasonable in the circumstances and we can see that from the Trustees Act 2000 which we're going to look at in a moment. The provisions as to the remunerations of trustees in the, the Trustees Act 2000 apply only where they have not been expressly excluded by the trust instrument itself. Now, in Reed Duke of Norfolk Settlement Trust in 1982, it was said that the court has inherent jurisdiction to approve remuneration of trustees, but would only exercise that jurisdiction in exceptional circumstances, such as where the management of the trust required considerably more work than was anticipated. So trustees must usually act for free as a general rule. However, the court has an inherent jurisdiction to authorise payment to the trustees, even if there is no such provision in the trust instrument. But this jurisdiction is only exercised in exceptional circumstances. So in this case here, we Duke of Norfolk Settlements Trust, uh, management of the trust was considered uh, was consider considerably more onerous than the trustees originally agreed to. So in such a circumstance, the court held it was fair for them to be paid for the time. But if the trust is no more onerous than you originally signed up to, then you cannot rely on the inherent jurisdiction of the court. Specifically in this case, the trustee claimed an extra £25,000 in fees for exceptional and unforeseen work involved in a central London property redevelopment scheme and similar work surrounding the capital transfer uh, ta tax 1975 introduction and also to revise the fee scale for the future. So the court held that um, the, the court held that they had the inherent jurisdiction to permit the increased fees to be given to the trustee. However, the Trustee Act 2000 provides that trustees who are acting in the course of their profession or trust corporations may be paid for acting as a trustee. This does not override the trust instrument. So the other circumstance is that since 2000, there is a statutory provision for the payment of trustees who are acting in the course of their profession. This does not allow any person acting as a trustee to be paid for what they are doing. You must be acting in the course of your profession. In other words, you have to be appointed because you are an accountant, a solicitor, a financial advisor, a trust corporation, etc. Now, um, it is perfectly legitimate and common for professionals such as solicitors to act as paid trustees um, if the trust instrument so allows or is silent on the question. And commercial trusts will, as a general rule, have professional trustees. 
Lay trustees such as family members cannot be paid for acting as trustees unless there is a specific provision in the trust instrument. So if you're a solicitor, um, an accountant, etc., and happen to be a trustee, but not acting in the course of your profession, you cannot be paid. Okay, You cannot rely on the statute to be paid. Now, as a general rule, trustees of charities also cannot be paid, and this is pretty much always enforced. However, the trustees can approve the payment of a trustee for services other than being a trustee, subject to certain conditions. So, a trustee may be paid for providing services to the charity, subject to certain conditions. You would need to inform the charity commission, though, if you charity commissioner, if you were going to do this, though. Incidentally, and related to this, a charitable trustee is not allowed to become employee of the same charity unless 18 months has elapsed since their resignation and taking up that paid position. So this is something known as the pool borough rule. And finally, in Boardman and Phipps, it was held that the solicitor was entitled to a fair payment for his services, which resulted in a larger profit or a large profit for the trust. However, the solicitor was not a trustee. He was the legal advisor to, but not a member of the board of trustees. Okay. So if you want to read a bit more about this case or listen to a bit more about this case and check out my previous video where I did go into this case in a lot more depth, but I would recommend you read this case in its entirety because it's really important for trusts and trust law. Okay, so this wraps up this video and we're going to have one more video on the duties of trustees and then we're going to move on to a slightly different area of equity and trust. But if you have any questions about this video, then please leave a comment below and I'll get straight back to you. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much for watching.